Okay, so let's get started going over this worksheet. This is a very important worksheet, as they all are. And in this particular worksheet, we're working with a new skill, which is determining the Ka of an acid using our titration curves that we've been doing in the lab. And of course, the Ka is a number we want to see if we're dealing with weak acids because they don't completely dissociate. And what we're going to need to understand how we actually derive or at least obtain a Ka okay, from an acid is we need an important formula called a Henderson-Hasselbach. And this formula we're going to derive from our understanding how acid and bases, or at least how acids dissociate, and our basic understanding of equilibrium, no pun intended. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw an acid reaction. So I'll write it as acid reaction, and you could do the same. All right, so my acid reaction, what do I have here? Well, I have an acid, and I'll write it as HA. It's one way that we draw a general acid. It could be anything. It's got an H in front. And by itself, and we're going to say equilibrium, there's no base driving it, okay? So it's going to break apart into a proton. We know that probably gets absorbed by the water. And it makes its conjugate base the A-. minus. So what we have is we have the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. Okay, now what we do know is that we can express how well this acid becomes H plus and A minus by an equilibrium expression. In fact, we can actually measure how well it goes forward, okay? Because we know that equilibrium values or expressions tell us how much products or reactants over here, okay, we have. So, so we're going to talk about a Ka. So let's get up close and personal. Here we have a Ka, which is Kq. Remember, we had Kw, many different examples, is equal to the concentration of the products. In this case, the product here is H plus times the concentration of the conjugate base, A minus, all over, okay, the HA. Now, HA is going to be an aqueous solution, so we can do this. All right, and remember, don't forget, don't get lost in the sauce here. If we have a weak acid, okay, as I'm trying to show, weak acids barely dissociate. So they're not going to go forward that much. Notice the little arrow. So that means we're not, we're going to have small amounts of products, but we're going to have huge amounts of what? Unreacted acid. So the Ka's are going to be, what, small, okay, to show that it doesn't go forward that much. In any case, okay, as we go this way, and no pun intended there for the Ka there, okay, so, sorry, keep doing that. Let's rewrite this, okay, so let's get back to uh, my color here, and I don't know if it's the same color, but we'll go for it. Ka is equal to the, I'm just going to break this part, the proton times uh, the conjugate base, A minus, and ha, the undissociated acid. All I did was kind of break it up here. Okay, so all I'm doing is showing you that I was just kind of breaking this up mathematically here, as I did here. Okay, now here's where the derivation kind of starts. Okay, let's go another color here. Okay, and let's make it a little smaller. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do the negative log to both sides. So I'm going to take this side of the equation, and I'm going to do negative log. And to this side of the equation, I'm also going to do the negative log. Okay. Now, the negative log of Ka, some number, we're going to call it the pKa. And the negative log of H plus, of course, is the pH. So this is going to be the pKa. So this is going to be the pKa. A, and it's going to equal to, well, let's separate these expressions. We can do negative log of these individually. The negative log of the H plus, as I just said, is the pH. Okay. And then the negative log of this, which is the conjugate base right here over the conjugate uh, acid. So it's going to be minus this expression, A minus over, oh, Christmas in July. I forgot the negative log, right? The negative because it's the negative log of this expression in, in circ that's encircled in yellow. So negative log, oops, 
So negative log, maybe, there we go, of the a minus to the ha. So this is basically the, the ratio of the concentration of the conjugate base to the conjugate acid. Okay, now we're going to simplify this and solve for pH. So when I do that, okay, oh, let's get a little funky here. We're going to go plus the log of a to the negative over ha. And what we do to one side, we do to the other. So plus the log of a negative over ha. And when you do that, what you get right below there is you're going to get back to reality here. You're going to get pKa. So we get pKa plus the log. That's just expression right here. I'm rewriting it. In conjugate base over the conjugate acid, HA, equals pH. And that is the henderson hasselbalch equation right there. Now, I'm just going to rewrite it one more time up here, just going to, so that we can read left to right. So pH is equal to the pKa, which is nothing more than the negative log of the Ka. Ka is just an equilibrium number. It tells me who's favored. Remember table L? Okay, that's what that is. pKa, and then plus the log of the A negative over the HA. And that, my friends, is the henderson hasselbalch equation. Now, you say, well, why in the world do I care about that? Because, well, we were plotting, okay, a plot of the volume, and, the, and at least in our examples, volume of base over the pH. And somehow we can relate the pH that we're looking in our temperature probes as we titrate an acid or base, and we can actually get the pKa from this. And if we can get the pKa, we should know party people to go backwards from the pKa to the Ka, it's going to be 10 to the negative x. And we can actually get the Ka from this and decide if how strong our acid is from our proofs. Now, to explain all this, okay, what about this expression here? Okay, what about this expression here? Well, you know that the pH equals the pKa plus this expression. Well, this is going to come out of our understanding of the next part of this worksheet. So let me show you how I am going to, all right, how I'm going to solve for the Ka of an acid just given a pH curve. So right here, what I have here is I have a pH curve. And in this pH curve, okay, you can see that the pH is going up. So we have added a strong base. We should all know that right there is our strong base. Okay, so there's our strong base, party people. So there's our strong base. And we added a strong base. Now, we are titrating a weak acid with this strong base. Now, how do I know it's a weak acid? Well, there's a couple of little clues. First and foremost, the first clue is that this curve is kind of bunched upward. Our first titration was a strong acid, not a weak acid. This one's a weak acid, okay? This one's a weak acid that we have added strong base to, and the strong base is going to force the weak acid to give up its proton, okay? And that's where the stoichiometry comes in. Now, the first thing I understand is when I look at this curve, okay, this asymptote is kind of small. If you remember Okay, if you remember that, uh, let's do a different color here. Let's do green because I feel like it. Um, if you remember, in the strong acid, strong base titration, it started lower because it had a lower pH, and this line stayed what? Pretty constant. Didn't go up. And when it got to the equivalence, it flew up asymptotically, and then it finished very similarly. So I know that this is not a strong acid, strong base, because I can see that this curve here is not there. I can see that the asymptote is much smaller. Okay, now strong acids are not going to change their pH much initially, and then they're going to fly through a much larger asymptote, okay, to get to the what? Much basic endpoint. 
All right, now, a weak acid is going to come up a little bit, not stay flat, and there's a reason for that, and please pay attention. Weak acids, as we're all going to see, make strong conjugate base. So if I take a weak acid and write it as HA, it's going to dissociate and be driven forward. Remember, it's got a Ka. It has a small K. It barely goes forward. But if you add, and I should add that, if you add, okay, um, hydroxide is a strong base, you will drive this forward. Notice no double arrow. We're going to drive it forward to make water and, of course, a negative. We're going to drive this reaction. As long as I have enough hydroxide, I can force every HA to go to completion. Okay, that's important you understand that. All right, now what am I after here? Well, as I drop base, this is dropping base onto the acid, the weak acid, I'm producing a conjugate base that has an ability to do this, and I'm changing the colors because it's really important. Once I have a negative in water, if it's what? A conjugate base of a weak acid. Remember, weak acid, hey, stronger conjugate base. This base is going to be sitting in water. And what's it going to do? It's going to pull H pluses from a water. It's going to act as a strong base. It's going to ionize water. And it's going to make, okay, OH minuses. And, of course, reform the acid. That's why it's a weak acid. So by making this, what? Strong conjugate base sit in water, it's going to yank some H's and produce some hydroxides. So if you notice, the curve here that I see is going up pretty steadily because I'm producing what? Extra conjugate base in the process. When it was a strong acid, like HCl, the reason why it's a strong acid is the conjugate base of the strong acid has no ability to react with the water. None. That's why it, stay, it doesn't reform the acid, unlike a what? Strong conjugate base. So that's important. That's the first thing I realized. And something else to realize, okay, is that when we dealt with a strong acid, strong base, the pH was approximately 7, okay, because what? Well, the strong acid, strong base doesn't make any what? Um, conjugate bases or acids that ionize water. But this one does, okay? Oops. So this one does. So this A minus does. It works with the water when it's made. So as we titrate and force the weak acid to become water, we make some conjugate what? Base. And that conjugate base, okay, right here, increases the pH because you're producing some extra hydroxides on top of that. Whereas in the strong acid down here, you didn't make any extra hydroxides with the conjugate base. Something else to think about, party people, as I look at this. Where is the equivalence point? Okay, let's get rid of some of this. So let's get rid of the strong base, strong acid part of the titration. Let's clean this up. So let's look at the curve as given to us. We should be able to recognize. Now, we should notice that the equivalence point is right in the middle of the asymptote. And notice something. The pH at the equivalence is 8, way above 7. Why? Aha, because as we, as we get to equivalence, and you should know this is equivalence. And what is equivalence? The equivalence point, you have to know, is when all of the what? H pluses, in this case HA, has now reacted with just enough OHs to drive away the HA. There's no more. Okay? So it's where the H pluses equal the hydroxides or the place where we have 0% what? HA. Here we have 100% HA. Let's think with me for a second. What else do we have here? 0% A minus. What else do we have up here? Well, at the equivalence point, where I've added just enough hydroxides that we titrated with to drive this forward and eliminate HA, Okay, we have 0% HA, but now we must have 100% conjugate base. And that conjugate base that I just mentioned is going to react with water to produce some hydroxides. Weak acid, strong conjugate base. And that's going to react with water and produce more hydroxides. And that's why the pH at equivalence 
for a weak acid, strong base titration going up, is going to be above 7. All right, now, we still haven't solved the mystery why we need this formula. Remember, the whole point of this worksheet is to learn that we can grab the Ka from the weak acid. So watch, party people. Now, if this is 0% HA and this is 100%, where would be 50%, 50%? Wouldn't that be half equivalence point? Remember, the equivalence point, we go find that volume. That's what we've done with all of our curves. We find that there's 20 milliliters right here. And in that 20 milliliters, knowing the molarity of the base we added, we can solve for the what? Moles of base needed to exactly neutralize all of the H plus or HA. Okay, well, if 20 milliliters will reach us to the equivalence point, okay, which is the point where we've matched up all the hydroxides with the HA and wiped out all the HA, then wouldn't 10 milliliters, half of that volume, be the half equivalence point? Yes. And that's where the half equivalence point comes into play, right here. What's so special about the half equivalence point? What's so special, party people, is that at the half equivalence point, all right, we know that there is 50% HA left, and 50% of the A minus has been made. If we've driven, ooh, okay, if we've driven the reaction forward to this point, which is half of the volume needed to neutralize the acid, we've driven it halfway by adding the strong base, we've converted half of the HA into what? A minus. That's it. So the half equivalence point is the place where we have equal amounts of what? Acid and base. Now, if you don't see that, let's look at it carefully here. Okay, let's change our ink. Let's look at it carefully here and make it smaller so we can see. So let's do an ice table. Let's do HA. Let's do the hydroxide which is going to force the H off. A weak acid doesn't normally give that up. We know we're going to make water, and we're going to make the A negative, which is the conjugate base. Okay, so let's just think about this. Here's my ice table. Some of you guys saw it already. Sorry if I'm reviewing something. You understand, but hey, too bad. Let's make up some numbers. Remember, a stoichiometry table is moles. So let's make this one mole. And let's pretend that half equivalence, we've added what? So we've, we have a mole of H pluses or HA in a beaker. They're not all dissociated, but we added what? At half equivalence, half the amount needed. Yep, that's what it means. So we have half of that. Now we have zero and zero initially. Well, what's the change? Well, if this has a what? One-to-one -one ratio, we can clearly see that the limiting reagent is going to be the hydroxide. So minus 0.5 moles, minus 0.5 moles, and this will be plus 0.5 moles. And this will be plus 0.5 moles because we're making it. And you can see what's left over is we have 0.5 moles of HA unreacted. And we have what? Oh, that's minus, that's going to be plus. This is going to be no base left because we added just enough base to neutralize half of it so half remains and notice something we made 0.5 moles of conjugate base yes we made 0.5 moles of water congratulations but these guys are the same so at half equivalence when we add what when we add just enough base to half neutralize okay half neutralize the acid, we're going to produce equal amounts of conjugate base, and the remaining HA will be the same. That should be clear. Now, again, why do I care about that? Because I'm saying it here. Let's go back to our formula party, people. At half equivalence, here's where the henderson hasse block earns its money. Yeah. Okay. So where does it earn its money? Well, at half equivalence, isn't this number and this number the same? I know it's almost full. Isn't this number and this one almost the same? Yes. And so if you put the same number with the same number, then what you're going to get is 1. And the log of 1 equals 0. This whole expression 
goes to zero when these equal each other. And lo and behold, pH equals the pKa when these guys are equal. So that means pH equals the pKa at the what? Half equivalence point. So all you do is find the half equivalence point, like we just did. Okay. And we go to the side and we go find that number. Now I'm going to just kind of rough estimate here. But that estimate for me means that this is approximately 5.0. The pH at the half equivalence point equals 5. But wait a minute, the pH. So the pH equals the pKa at the half equivalence. And so the pKa equals 5.0. Now what we want is the Ka. So if you know the pKa, which is the negative log of the Ka, how do I get the actual Ka? Already people, to go from a pKa to the actual value, we go 10 to the negative 5. So the Ka is equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 5, which is a small number, which tells us that what? There are what? More reactants than products. Remember, KQ or KA is the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. And so we have a what? Heck of a lot more what? Reactants for an undissociated weak acid. So that's how we do it. And that's how henderson hasselbloch occurs or how we use it. We use it to our advantage. We make this go to zero when we have equal amounts of conjugate acid and conjugate uh, say conjugate acid and conjugate base. The log of this one is zero. So anytime we're trying to find the Ka, we find the half equivalence point, okay, which is going to be half the volume from the what? Equivalence point, which uh, by the way is what? In the middle part of that asymptote. And we can work backwards to find, hey, this point here and read the pH. pH equals the pKa at the half equivalence. Kind of cool. We can do that right graphically. So let's go back and keep going on the second page. All right, so on the back page here, we have table M that I gave you, and these are a list of common acid-base indicators. And as we've seen before, uh, and we've used in lab, they help us give us something called an endpoint to a titration. They can have a color change. As long as that color change, as I'll talk about again, is on the asymptote, that color change will occur okay, and help us tell us when to stop, and it helps us um, estimate the actual equivalence point. So what does this mean? Well, phylothaline is going to be colorless up into all pHs up until 8, and then it's going to turn pink after 9 and beyond. So that's what it tells us. And why is that true? Well, it's true because phenolphthalein actually is a weak acid itself. They love to write indicators this way. They take HI, and I is for the indicator. It's a weak acid, so it's going to be an equilibrium. It's got a low Ka. It's going to break apart into the proton. Not much, though. Barely goes forward, and it's going to make the rest of the molecule, well, usually a very big organic molecule, and there's its conjugate base. What's interesting is that the different forms of the acid, its conjugate acid and its conjugate base, have different shapes to them. Now, I'm showing you HI and I negative, but in truth, these are huge macromolecules. And when they lose H's, and they, their, their actual form of these macromolecules change conformationally to a way that they don't no longer absorb wavelengths of light differently. So in the case of phenolphthalein, they don't absorb wavelengths of light, so HI, or the acid form of phenolphthalein, is clear. But in a basic solution, okay, all right, or when you have more of the conjugate base form, all right, that conjugate base has a different color, way to think about it. So basically, uh, uh, no pun intended, these have different colors. Let's look at methyl orange. Methyl orange is red, so we can think of methyl orange as being a red color in when it's in its conjugate acid form, and it's in its yellow color in its conjugate base form. Got that? So let's all stop and go for the, the, the lovely baked goods. All right, so that's important. All right, so this is the yellow 
And so that's what we're doing here. Now, when would we see a color change? Okay, well, we see the color change in this range. And that's really important. So don't forget, these guys are what? Acids. So let's think about this for a second. Let's get up close and personal here. Let's think about what this means. So if I have a, if I'm going to titrate, let's say methyl orange. Okay, it's a weak acid. So it's going to have some curve that looks like this. Has a little what? Asymptote and steadily comes up like we talked about. So as I said, if we're going to look at a titration curve for the weak acid, okay, let's write it here, HI, the indicator, which is a weak acid, becoming a little bit of H+, plus. it's not a strong acid, and to the indicator negative, we said that we have a color associated with the um, um, conjugate acid and a color associated with a conjugate base. And again, these are macromolecules. So let's just kind of co color coordinate that from methyl red. We are red, ooh, that's too big. Well, we're red in the uh, acidic region. Let's make that smaller, okay. Uh, and uh, let's do that here. And let's go smaller. So we're going to go a little red here. And then the other one is going to be yellow. And so what does this look like? Well, if it's a weak acid like we just did before, and if you're paying, paying attention, okay, we notice that there's a 100% what? 100% HI here. And at this position, there's 0% HI. So there's a lot of what? There's a lot of red, okay, in this area. All right, right up here. Now, as we make, and this is important, as we go forward, and as if we were to add a base to drive this reaction, okay, if we were to add a base to drive this reaction, so we have 100% HI here, and so we have a lot of red. But as I said, if we add strong base to this, it's going to drive this forward. And as we force HI to become the conjugate base and the proton, hey, we're making more what? Making more yellow compound. And so that starts to build up. So when do we start to see enough of the I negative? Probably around halfway equivalence, right? So we start making more and more I, because remember, at this point, there's 0% I negative, right? And at this point, there's 100% I negative as we force with the hydroxide this reaction. So if I go to my colors, um, and I guess I'm going to with yellow, the yellow kind of starts here. And so right around equivalence, it should make sense to you, at the halfway equivalence point, that's where you're going to see a noticeable color change. And of course, when you have what both colors available, you're going to get a mixing of the colors. And that's why when we looked back at, okay, uh, table M, if you have a pH range in between, you're going to probably have orange here. Bromothymol blue, if you have yellow and blue, the in between color between 6 and 7.6 .6 is going to be green. So that's what that is, party people. That's a, essentially these weak acids, okay, getting titrated. And their color changes because these are some important mic macromolecules that have color associated with them. And we'll look at that later. So if the color change is probably going to be more cognizant right at the half equivalence, you could see in table M that the middle pH is where you can see that happening is probably going to be where its pKa is. Hello, look at the pKa, 3.4. Isn't that a middle of 3.1 and 4.4? So Basically, we take the pKa of the what? Of the weak acid, which is the half equivalence point. Find that pH. At that pH, the pH equals the pKa. Okay, we just, we just, we just solved for that. So we don't really have pH ranges. We have pKs. But it's pretty interesting to see, though, how the, um, how the uh, pKas wind up being the middle of these color changes. Bromothyma blue is from 6 to 7.6 and that's going through what? The half equivalence point at 7.1. So all of these tend to what? Be right in the middle of those pH swings. So that's what common, so, so that's how we use the pKa or let's, what, that's what the pKa of the common indicators are. They give us basically where the color swings and essentially we want the color to a change if we're going to use this indicator when we have an equivalence point. Okay, so let me explain this one more time or a different way. So let's go back to 
uh, another graph. Let's go back to our strong acids, strong acids, strong base titration. Start low, don't really increase, and then boom, big asymptote. And then the equivalence point is going to be about pH of 7 with strong acid, strong base. And I said to you, because of the asymptote, the most important part of the pH is, the, is to find the equivalence point and find what? This volume here. Okay, that's going to link us to the moles of the base that was needed. So what we want is, we want to have an indicator, and let's use um, methyl red, a little red here. We want the indicator to uh, essentially reach its half equivalence point somewhere here. So if I'm titrating what? Phenolphthalein probably looks like this. And notice the half equivalence point occurs on the asymptote of the other titration. So when I'm adding a base to an acid and I have a few drops of phenolphthalein, I'm also titrating that. But notice its half equivalence point is going through my asymptote. And so if it's pKa, which is equal to the pH, right? If it's pKa, okay, the pH at its halfway point, okay, is on the asymptote, it's an appropriate what? Indicator, all right? So phenolphthalein, its pK is 9.4. And so that's on the asymptote. And so that would be appropriate indicator. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be given a list of indicators and being asked to figure out if it's an appropriate indicator. And all you need to do is see if the pKa of the indicator is usually plus or minus 1. Okay, it's a good, good kind of rule of thumb, plus or minus 1 from the equivalence point. So if my equivalence point is 7, I'm looking for something from 8 to 6. Now, you know what? I, I see the phenolphthalein is 9.6, but what would be equivalent for that for 7? Well, bromothumb blue, okay, litmus would be two good choices, okay? So given the pK is above and what I just taught you, what, which indicators would be appropriate for the titration on the first page? Okay, well, where was the equivalence point on the first page? Let's go back there. Okay, on the first page, the equivalence point was at a pH of 8. So we want our pKa for the indicator to be plus or minus 1 that within range. So anywhere from 9 to 7. Okay, roundabout. So let's go back to the page. And so if I'm trying to pick what would be appropriate for this question here, number 1, okay, uh, I'm looking for 9 or 7-ish. So we would definitely use um, for that bromothymol blue because it's 7. And I probably could stretch it to uh, something around 8 or 8-ish. Oh, I'm sorry. That was an 8 on the other page. So anything 9-ish. So a phenolphthalein would probably work. Um, maybe it's a little bit too far. A better answer probably is thymol blue. But I would accept all three. These are close to that. I know the rule of thumb is plus or minus 1, so I guess the best answer probably would be the bromothymol blue, okay, and of course the thymol blue. This one's just a little bit outside that, but I would probably accept it's close enough. But these would be the best two indicators. If I asked for the best two indicators, okay, they, they would be the best because, again, if the um, equivalence is at 9, plus or minus 1, you're going from 8, I'm, the equivalence is 8 of the other page, I'm sorry, we're going to go from 9, approximately 9 to 7, okay, and that's where these guys fall in the range, pretty simple.